Welcome back to the final installment of lecture series, Picture This, Looking at Signs and Symbols. We are on part five, pictograms and wayfinding. Part four was a sort of live interactive activity that I haven't figured out how to replicate yet uh, for virtual learning. So no, you're not confused. There just is no part four on the YouTube channel. Sorry. Okay, let's see. So if you recall, the godfather of pictorial signage, Nerath, way back from lecture two, his goal was to aid people by directly illustrating information about the world and by designing information that could be universally understood in the aim of overcoming barriers of language and culture. So today we're gonna look at wayfinding systems and how to develop a language of way showing, of visually communicating to people. So this is sort of like bonus step five, we're not really going to implement this in um, our project. However, I think it's kind of nice to just finish out the lectures on pictorial design and kind of give you some practical application for it. Okay. So wayfinding can be described as a spatial problem solving. It is knowing where you are in a building or in an environment and knowing where your desired location is, and then finally knowing how to get from where you are to where you wanna go, right? Wayfinding, where am I? Where do I wanna go? How do I get there? Way showing relates to wayfinding as cooking relates to eating, right? Or writing relates to reading. What the designer does is not to solve the problem of finding the way, but the designer helps facilitate people's own problem solving. So the development of way finding systems is one aspect of environmental design. If you find this presentation particularly interesting, environmental design is a graphic design niche that you could explore further. So way showing is how designers facilitate people's own problem solvings. What we can do to help people figure out where they are, where they wanna go, and how they can take themselves there. So wayfinding systems are a very important part of design. It's particularly important in complex building environments like urban centers, hospitals, educational campuses, healthcare systems, and transportation facilities, right? Airports, train stations. As architectural environments become more and more complicated, people need visual cues like maps and directions and symbols to help guide them to their destinations. In urban settings, wayfinding specialists develop signage and information systems for both pedestrians and motorists because they each have a unique challenge of navigating the streets and roadways. So these information systems help people develop a mental map of the terrain and simplify their routes to uh, as much of an extent as possible. So this is an example of um, a signs put up in New York City to help people understand where they are. Um, so in New York City, there's subways which run underground. And obviously there's a lot of tourists in New York City, but even just regular people. When you pop out of the subway system back above ground, a lot of times you're disoriented. You've been weaving around underground, walking upstairs. You're not exactly sure when you pop out which way is north, which way is south, where am I? I'm just on some street corner and how do I get from where I am to where I wanna go? Um, so that is why this whole series of signs was developed and placed outside of key subway stops 
to help people, again, understand where they are and see a map to understand where maybe they're trying to go and how best to get there. On healthcare campuses, there's definitely a unique set of navigational challenges since, you know, every floor often looks the same. Um, however, every floor is really different in what their function is. And oftentimes people visiting these healthcare campuses are under a lot of stress, right? So a wayfinding system can help reduce uh, people who enter the building their stress by providing easy to follow signage and legible directions to their destinations. Um, so in some settings, just relying on text-based messaging uh, is, is minimized and the system can rely on sort of non-text non -text cues like colors and symbols to help make people quickly identify where they are or where they've been. Um, so in, like in this example, you've probably seen this if you've ever gone into a, like a children's hospital or like a nicer facility, um, you know, where every floor is a different color. That way you're in a high pressure situation, you're stressed out, you're not really thinking. Maybe you're apt to remember that you were somewhere where it was green or somewhere where there was a giant A or somewhere with a big two on the floor. So there's a few different visual cues at play to help people so that maybe they'll remember at least one of those things. In a transportation setting, like an airport, travelers need to get information to guide them from you know, the roadway, through the airport, through the terminal complex. There's a lot of right traveling through these very large structures. Um, and so a lot of these systems provide directional guidance with carefully planned sequences that deliver information to users at key decision points along the journey, right? Because if you've ever traveled through a large airport, you're walking a really long way and making a lot of decisions about how to get from where you are to where you need to go. So instead of giving you all the directions at once, which could be overwhelming, you're just given enough information to make it to the next crossroads to make your next decision. Um, so that is all part of way showing, not showing people too much at once, but just enough to get them to the next step further to where they're trying to go. So a lot of really comprehensive wayfinding systems will often combine signage and maps and symbols and colors and other communications to um, increasingly, in, and they have increasingly integrated mobile applications and digital displays into their solutions. So again, you can see here, you've got a person holding a paper map and looking at, this is actually a digital display of a, um, of a map, it's like an interactive map that was up in a very touristy area in, I want to say Copenhagen, but I can't quite remember the city. Um, so people can look at their paper map and kind of interact with this screen map to figure out, oh, okay, this is where I am. This is where I'm trying to get. And now I can locate myself on my paper map so I can take the paper map with me because the streets are very, as you see by the map, irregular and curvy. And a lot of times tourists have a really hard time navigating the space. So this was an attempt to help the tourists. All right, so we're gonna go on to five general principles of way showing. Okay, so our first principle of way showing is create an identity at each location. So the principle is give every location a unique perceptual identity so that the navigator can associate their immediate surroundings with a location in the larger space. The visitor's ability to recover position and orientation is the core wayfinding principle. So again, you saw this example earlier, you're creating an identity 
at each location. So you get off the elevator, all of a sudden the floor and the ceiling are green, all the signage is green, there's a big A, there's a bunch of twos on the floor. You go one more floor up and the next picture above the green picture, all right, everything is now that like magenta color. There's a big three instead of an A. The walls on the floor are that red color. There's a B instead of an A. So you know you're in a different zone. Hopefully then the person in the space can recall either what color or what letter or what number they saw uh, to understand where they were in the space. So some design applications are distinctive color theme, textures, finishes, or lighting styles. Next we have use landmarks to provide orientation cues. So landmarks as an orientation cue, if the navigator knows where a landmark is in relation to their position, they can say something about where they are. So a desirable property of a landmark for this use is visibility, the ability to be seen from a large surrounding areas, right? So if you are, think about how like if you've ever parked in like a very large parking lot, a lot of times there will be like flags on the light poles that'll tell you you're in penguin right, or you're in monkey. And so you can remember, oh, I'm by the penguin flag. I'm just to the south and east of the penguin flag. So you've now been able to orient yourself to this landmark of penguin flag so that when you come back to the parking lot after being away for so many hours, you can recall, oh, I'm by the penguin flag to the southeast. That's the point of landmarks. And some design applications would be um, monoliths, which is like this example from the Washington National Zoo. Um, so like tall structures, basically. <laughs> um, and signage totems are ideal for this purpose to create a visual point of reference, which visitors recognize as the information mechanism at a distance, right? So this would be, it's actually considered a totem because there's different symbols stacked on top of each other um, versus a monolith would just be like if there was just one giant eagle statue. Okay, number three, create well-structured paths. So the principle here is paths should possess a set of characteristics to be well-structured. A well-structured path maintains a navigator's orientation with respect to both the next landmark along the path and the distance to the eventual destination. I like this picture. This is of an office building, but they actually created like literally stripes on the floor, pathways to go navigate through the office. Um, and the pathways you can see like the orange one takes you into this conference room. So very literal translation of creating well-structured paths. Uh, so the design application here is that this can be as simple as telling the visitor how far it is to their destination so they can measure their progress as they get closer and confirm they're on the right path. Think about mile markers on the highway. Four is create regions of differing visual character, the principle being Subdivide the space into regions with a distinct set of visual attributes to assist in wayfinding. I think by the pictures you can tell that this is definitely one that happens in theme parks a lot, right? So a design application would be regions allow the navigator to distinguish one part of the space from another to and to know when they have moved across a boundary between the two. These boundaries help serve as sort of like demarcations along the well-structured path that they've traveled through different regions or zones. So, right, if you are in Tomorrowland and you wanna to go to Fantasyland, 
there are definitely visual cues as you move through Tomorrowland that you're still in Tomorrowland, still in Tomorrowland. Oh, you've crossed into Fantasyland. The architecture change, the signage information change, the overall aesthetic change. You're clearly in a different zone of the amusement park. And then, of course, there are more corporate right ways that you could take this same premise but I think amusement park is like the one that everyone I think has some familiarity with and you can understand it easiest all right and the last principle is don't give the users too many navigational choices um, there is a story to tell when you're designing a space so that it's coherent for every route that the navigator might take okay so Sometimes it's not about telling somebody all of their choices, but just telling them how to get to the things they are most likely looking for. Like, where is the coffee maker? Where is the bathroom? Where is the exit? Um, opportunities for detours, side tours, and exploration that can branch off of the main path is fine as long as it eventually returns to the main path or the main story. Uh, of how someone's going to walk through your space. You want to make sure that your visitor is using, uh, is understanding where they are in position in the building or in space. Um, and that how they understand how to get from like the lobby doors to the receptionist desk a few floors up um, or, you know, versus how would they take a side tour, if you will, to things like the bathroom or the coffee maker? And so here's just some examples of, again, using the idea of pathways. This time, instead of on the floor, they're on the wall. And you can also see that there are different color zones to help people move through a confusing office space situation. Okay. My last section is wayfinding design and graphic communication uh, and how it applies to us. So signage assists people in the decision-making process, uh, helping them find their way, right? That's what we've just gone over. When the signage system has insufficient graphic cues, visitors can become confused and lost. So properly planning and executing graphic information assists users in finding their destinations. We've got four main types of wayfinding graphics. So this is like things that us as designers would create. We can create graphics for information, oh sorry, for identification, for direction, for information, and for regulatory purposes. Graphics for identification. Identification signs uh, simply let your reader know where they are, pointing out specific structures or landmarks that might help them to gain their bearings. These signs aren't intended to offer directions, but they can contribute to recognition by reminding your visitors of maybe like your company name and your company logo um, and that kind of stuff. Identification signs can identify maybe like a specific room, like a conference room or a break room, the bathroom. They could provide like you are here sort of designations on maps and entryways. They could identify exit signs or entry points into a building. And that's an example again of an informational sign, an identifying sign on a corner of a city street. Next, we've got directional signs. So directional wayfinding graphics are what most people think of when they begin thinking about a wayfinding strategy, right? These are the signs that are gonna help keep people moving towards their destination. They're gonna appear in junctions, they're gonna be directional, um, and they're gonna give guidance. Think about signs and like elevator lobbies showing you what's available on each floor. Um, display signs at junctions offering basic directions like bathrooms to the left, 
elevator straight ahead. Information signs. Information signs are less about ushering people towards a destination, but more about providing with supplemental knowledge along the way. So you might use a sign in a hospital that uh, to dictate that a visitor is about to enter a dangerous area. Um, you might use an informational sign to help separate um, areas designated for personnel from spaces open to the public. These types of wayfinding systems definitely can alert visitors to um, positive things like free Wi-Fi. Um, they can let people know that they can have access to more information about a facility. And they can definitely tell visitors when and where to take caution. So here are just some different visual examples of informational signage. Um, like every time you get in and out of an elevator, there's usually a big sign there with like what's on that floor. That's an informational sign. And the last type of wayfinding graphics are regulatory graphics. These are um, signage that informs visitors of requirements and regulations that are in place for certain areas, like no parking uh, notices outside a building door, um, or things like no smoking signs, that sort of thing. Okay, oh, sorry, I lied. This is our last section. Design tips and how to's, okay get practical here. So here's a quote from Lance Wyman, the guy who did the original pictograms for the Washington National Zoo. He says, don't overlook the obvious. Designers too often neglect exploring ideas because they seem too obvious, trite, corny, etc. When the obvious is transformed into a new image, it can be powerful and easily understood. And I think that's really a great advice for us as we do this project, right? We're not looking to reinvent the overall system of pictograms in play here. We are just looking to add to the system. So we don't wanna do anything that's too far removed from what it already looks like, okay? And you don't wanna do anything that's right too far removed from some of the obvious choices or prime physical characteristics of our animals because other people quickly identifying what animal you are depicting is paramount to success here. Okay, here are my design tips. So when icons function as part of a larger design solution, like a mobile app or a wayfinding system or this project, <laughs> consider their design in relation to the broader project, ensuring they function both as a standalone solution and within the broader context. Accurately depict the shape of the object to allow users to recognize and decipher the icon at a glance. So that is my first tip. Accurately depict the shape of the object. If you aren't able to draw the animal accurately enough, grab some tracing paper, grab your image from your contact sheet and trace your image, your animal to make sure that you get an accurate profile. Since that again is key to people understanding your visual. Aim for elemental form. So economy of form trumps intricacy or complexity. The details and any excessive information are going to confuse the user, especially at a smaller size. Use the most characteristic angle. Represent your image from its most characteristic angle. Again, you have to think about it in context of the larger uh, sign set, since we are working within an existing set. Um, if you weren't working within an existing set and you're doing something from scratch, that I think 
speaks for itself. Use the most rep characteristic angle. Uh, within the context of what we're doing, think about what that means versus what everything else already looks like. Use recognizable images. Select commonly recognizable images that the audience will understand. Okay, so find the most obvious representation of what you're doing. Color and tone for impact. Select color and tones for impact, for legibility, for meaning, for storytelling, and for context. So it's a lot of obviously flexibility in that statement and subjectivity. Um, for again, for our project, you're creating a black and white sign. So there's not really much room for some color and tone for impact, um, but there is a little. So again, specifically think about what that means for legibility, for meaning, and for context. Consistent icons in system. This is one of the key tips for our current project, right? You have to treat all the icons within the system consistently in terms of style of visualization, in terms of perspective, and in terms of how close or far you are from the animal. So as a general rule, if one icon is cropped, they should all be cropped. If one animal is facing left, they should all be facing left. If, um, if you have a set of signs that have a lighting source and maybe have you know, a little bit more visual detail to them, make sure that your lighting source is consistent and that all your objects are shaded consistently. And my last design tip is work on black and white backgrounds. Um, which this means that the icon itself should work well on both a white and a black background, aka it should work on either a light or a dark background. Um, and it should also work well in different scale sizes, right? Because a lot of times when you make a pictogram, it's going to be used really small on a map. It's going to be used kind of big on a sign. It's going to be used huge on like a monolith. So these visuals have to work at any scale and they have to work on a variety of backgrounds. So think about that as well when you're designing your visuals. Okay, those are all of my design tips. Hopefully those kind of help you put all the information you've heard about all the lectures back into the context, context of our assignment. So again, you're gonna accurately depict the object shape. You're gonna aim for an elemental form. You're gonna use the most characteristic angle. You're gonna use recognizable images. You're gonna use color and tone for impact. You're gonna have consistent icons within the system and you're gonna work uh, in, you actually are going to work in black and white. So we'll just say that for the last tip. 